Hi, I'm Kevin. And I'm Amanda. And we are serving up all that jam. A lighthearted look at the weekend jam bands. Where we break down the jam scene's biggest stories, talk new bands, upcoming tours, and show reviews. A little laughing, some hot takes, and an always positive message for the community. Week of August 21st, 2023. Welcome back. We're really excited that you're here with us today. I'm Kevin. And I'm Amanda. And you are listening to the All That Jam Weekly Wrap-Up, a lighthearted look at the week in jam bands. We are entering the 34th week of 2023 and have so much going on. This weekend, Fish is back with two benefit concerts at SPAC to help flood victims in Vermont. We'll put a link in the show notes for you. We spoke to Ryan Lerman from Scary Pockets and Bob Braylove from The Grateful Dead last week. Make sure to look for that dropping soon. This week, we have the top three stories coming up, one of them which is very, very close to my heart, so we're going to dive into that. We're going to throw in some more fish thoughts at the end about this summer and our interview with Kevin Calabro, owner, Royal Potato Family, Calabro Music Media. And we hit on several artists on the label, Larry Campbell, Mike Dillon, Robert Walters. Plus, we get into the state of the industry. How are you doing, Amanda? Kevin, I'm good. I had a little bit of a quiet week this week after some travel, but gearing up for uh, some good music coming up in the next couple of days. Yes. Yeah, I took the week off myself, too, with uh, Dick's coming up and the kids starting college. There's a, It was a tsunami <laughs> won me there, so to speak. Um, Friday, that just passed, big day for releases. Grace Porter, she put out Mother Road, which is so welcome after four years since her Grammy-nominated Daylight in 2019. Uh, Karina Reichman dropped her debut, Joyride, which had Trey from fish as a co-producer and contributor to five tunes on the album recorded at the barn with bryce grog and this is a total fish thing going on uh this is a few older tunes which she released as singles that are reworked and uh i think the uh, song joyride is the one getting all the play and the other thing that caught my attention was widespread dropped the 13th installment in their archive series and it's been five years since they did one and this was a show from April 89 in Boone, North Carolina. It's the classic lineup, Bell, Hauser, Nance, Ortiz, Schools, and Herman. So if you like the panic, check that out. And with that, here is Amanda and the... The Top 3 Stories of the Week. Kevin, let's get into some of these stories. I'm going to start with one that's um, close to my heart as well. And this is uh, Denver based, but I think it's something that um, any music fan could really appreciate. Um, if you haven't heard of it, the Shine Music Festival um, is a music festival that is currently um, in its third year here. And the goal of this festival is to provide universal accessibility to all concert goers by using different types of adaptive technology. Um, it is considered the world's largest universally designed music festival, um, and it's taking place here um, this coming Saturday, August 26. I thought this was especially important to mention for a few reasons. Number one, um, we know that music brings people together in a way that very few other things can to create, you know, shared experiences and community. So everybody should be able to enjoy that safely and in, you know, the right way for them. But um, we actually do have some friends of All That Jam who are deeply involved. Um, Neil Evans, Frodown, which is uh, Neil, Dan Africano, who we recently talked with, um, as well as a whole bunch of others like Felix Pastorius. Yes, that Pastorius family. Um, Harry Waters, a bunch of incredible musicians um, will be there along with Sun Squabby and others. Um, it is a free festival. It is based around donations. Um, and there's just a lot more that's going to be happening there. So really excited. I can't wait for that. No, are they doing, are the things that they're incorporating are like new ideas? They're trying new technologies in order to help people who are disabled to be able to make it to shows, get in there. I know they showed the picture of somebody in a wheelchair being like crowd surfing. <laughs> I know. Yeah, definitely a little bit of an attention getter. But yes, yeah, so let me um just share a little bit about some of these features that are going to be present. And I do believe that um, all of these 
are more on that cutting edge, you know, side of things. Um, there's something called full body sound, and it translates music from the soundboard into tactile audio simulation. Um, there's something called X-ray glass, which is a new partner for this festival, and that provides closed caption glasses and an app that allows hard of hearing guests to see captions regardless of where they are. Um, and I'll mention just one more because I think these are incredible uh, ways to help everybody, you know, feel at ease. Um, Autism Community and the Sensory Club uh, are going to be providing what they call sensory zones for guests who might become overstimulated. Um, and so places where they can go um, specifically designed to really help kind of calm that nervous system and get people to a place where they want to be. Fantastic. I, I love that. Of course, as always, there will be a link down in the show notes if you want to go over to their website, check it out. Or if you're in Colorado, get over there. Yeah, tickets are not required. Admission is free. So really, they're just going to open it up uh, until, you know, the place is full. Um, and that's during the daytime, too. So definitely something that is good for families and other people who, you know, may already have things that they want to do on Saturday night. Um, so definitely wanted to talk about that. Um, this next uh, story, I'm going to be honest, it is complex. So I'm going to try to put this into just a few sentences, but it caught my eye because it's about Internet Archive. Now, Kev, you know this, um, and a lot of people who know me do, but, you know, Internet Archive is a place that I am on probably almost every day for one reason or another, either checking out my uh, my archive of radio shows on there or looking at, you know, live archive Um but they've just been sued for $400 million by um, pretty much all the major record labels, accusing um, Internet Archive of massive copyright infringement. And this lawsuit was just filed late last week. So it's still pretty new, but there have been some other challenges um, regarding copyrights on um, content in books and other things. So. You know, this is becoming kind of a, a debate here uh, in some of my circles about, well, has Internet Archive just been kind of, you know, running away from this? Maybe it was bound to happen. I don't know. Um, the the thing that this is the one that's passionate for me, because I've like you, I've inter uploaded a bunch of radiators at Volker solo shows that I was the only one who recorded and maybe 10 people have listened to them, but you know, whatever that is, but this focuses on the 78 project, which was them taking a bunch of old 78s, preserving them in the highest quality possible, and then wanting to lend them to people. That's the whole thing. The record companies are saying they aren't lending. People are streaming them. So this has become a terminology thing. And ultimately it's a failure of our legal system for laws to catch up what's going on. They're still thinking about Napstar and we've already moved in, you know, 500 years ahead of that at this point. And it really breaks my heart. I've been going on and downloading 78s and I'm going to fill up a hard drive with as much as I can in case it disappears. And maybe I'll try to host that somewhere and let them try to come after me because all, all we're trying to do is make it available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really, the fact that um, one of the major arguments, as I understand it, from the record label side is that uh, from their perspective, this particular project undercuts potential profits from selling licenses to stream the stuff. So, I mean, what we're talking about here, um, like you said, a lot of it, I think, is really caught up in probably legal language that's either outdated or not really designed to kind of handle this type of situation, which, by the way, could you only imagine how much time and money and effort Internet Archive has put into the restoration of those, you know, recordings? Because they, they get my measly 120 bucks a year. I give them 10 bucks mm -hmm. a month when they do the donation, you know, the the call out, the, M, the uh, public television thing, I like to call it. I throw them 120 bucks every year. I figure 10 bucks a month is more than worth it. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, so many of us have spent, you know, a lot of time with Internet Archive over the years. Um, and so when I saw this, Kevin, I actually didn't realize that you you had that kind of connection, but it immediately caught my eye because, you know, these programs like this project, which has been around since 2006, you know, a long time, um, it really makes it that much harder for other organizations to want to do this kind of preservation work. 
um, and really what I consider a public service, honestly. Um, so I know that there's already an appeal, so nothing's going to need to be, you know, paid anytime soon. However, I'm really hoping that there are some good legal minds working for Internet Archive to help them with this. All right. I mean, the only thing I can think, maybe uh, have it be a thing where you actually have to borrow it. I don't know. But how do you do that? Because when I go and listen, I'm listening to it once or I'm downloading it, you know, to check it out. Maybe the download is the issue. Maybe they should do it like the Grateful Dead so official model one there where you can only stream it. Yeah, I mean, there might have to be some concessions made, but the thought of Internet Archive having to pay back any of that. Um, which, you know, we'll destroy I, it. It'll be the end. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's already this, you know, nonprofit library. Have they maybe been, you know, skating around this issue for a while? Yeah, but that's not their fault. That's that's, a, I think, more of a judgment call on just the industry. The legal itself. system. It's the legal yeah. system. You know, they I, I don't know what the copyright thing in 2018 is really all about, but apparently that strengthened the ability like that's why pink floyd releases bootlegs from 1970 on spotify because they want to hold on to the copyright for it yes exactly exactly well i'll just um add this to um a couple of years ago actually right around the time that i met you kevin i had chatted with dave malik who is one of the longtime archivists at um live music archive and um we talked about the amount of of time and you know work that a very small group of people put into maintaining this plus the bandwidth to house all of that um, music right and all of those documents massive mm -hmm. um, and so it really did open my eyes to what goes on in the background to keep something like that so consistently available um, you know for this long so i'll definitely be following this one for sure all right, Kevin, let's let's go to something a little bit different. Um, you may have seen uh, some news recently that the Talking Heads are set to reunite for the first time in two decades uh, for some Q&A at the Toronto International Film Festival. Of course, um, this comes um, right at the mark of the 40th anniversary of Stop Making Sense, which put a lot of things in perspective for me <laughs> that it's 40 years old. Um, they're going to screen that, and this is going to be in early September. So first public appearance uh, with everybody in quite a long time. Uh, and the and the movie is going to be in theaters. Mm -hmm. um, Deme, the guy who, who uh, directed it, so fantastic. It might be the best concert. I don't want to call it a concert film because I think a concert film, I think of a straight shot. You know, this was so much production. It, it was like... You know, the uh, what he's doing on Broadway now, it's like the seeds of it were, you know, built into this. Um, the interesting thing I found is Byrne did an interview and he said I was a tyrant and he was like backing off and saying, yeah, I was the asshole and all this. So maybe mm -hmm. it leaves the door open to I mean, if they toured, if it was a money grab, they could make a fortune or they could just be really cool and say, we're going to do this because you guys 40 years later still love us. Like you do. I, I mean, knew the rest of the band would do it. You know, Tina yeah. and Chris, you know, would. I think they would definitely strongly consider it, right? Um, but yeah, you know, thinking about the legacy um, of that, you know, I, I guess they call it a movie adaptation uh -huh. of concerts, is, but it, it, it does defy, I think, even a description like that. Um, you know, it's been newly restored. And you're right, beginning, I think, around September 20th or so, it's going to be. Uh, a global run. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, and this is something I need to look into, just late last week, kind of prior to the theatrical release, um, there was a deluxe edition uh, soundtrack released via Rhino Records. So everything we already know, but the LP, um, I believe, contains a few previously unreleased tracks, um, as well as a, you know, vinyl version and with a 30 page booklet. So there's some, there's some new stuff, or I guess new to us, uh, right. stuff, some new liner notes. So if you're really, uh, you know, a huge fan of this, that might be something people, you know, would consider getting. Back in 2000, 2001, whenever it was, when I got my Tascam CDR W5000 for three thousand dollars what can you get a cd burner now for 50 bucks i can't um, even i spent all my high school graduation money on a 
two <laughs> two time CD burner, and I thought I was such hot shit. But that's me. <laughs> yep, exactly. So one of the first things I did was burned the video of Stop Making Sense to a CD so I could listen to it uh, whenever I wanted to. And I became the man at parties. I'd bring it over and I'd have the whole thing. I'd be like, oh, I, not just the album. This is the whole show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, uh, Byrne has also put some quotes out just about, you know, they're kind of like PR ready, but basically just, um, you know, that how happy he is to have this new release out there and, you know, that energy that was inspired by having the audience for what they filmed, you know, all those years ago now. So very fun. And um, I'm sure that they'll be live streaming and and providing options for those of us who don't live in Toronto, <laughs> Ryan Storm, right. to, uh, you know, to go in and listen for ourselves too. Right. A couple of uh, guys that I went to high school with, their father went to Lansdowne High in Maryland and Baltimore and was in high school with David Byrne. Hmm. And while we were talking to him one day about it, he's like, yeah, he was a weird dude. Nobody wanted to hang out with him. And I was like, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, if, if I heard the opposite of that, you know, total prepster, you know, right. it would, all things, I don't know how I would feel about that. <laughs> right. Exactly. I'd probably do a triple take. <laughs> exactly. So, all right, we're going to jump into this interview with Kevin Calabro. But before that, I just want to let you know what's coming up next week on all that jam uh tomorrow on tuesday we got scott sherrard on his rust belt lp wednesday we got joe marcinek on the art of the sit-in thursday billy ayuso on the the brides of jesus which is an early jam band they were attached to the wetland scene so you want to check that out tim blum on mother hips latest album and them doing a cover song on it of codeine the old quicksilver tune uh, Saturday, Jerry Joseph won Little Women and being called a jam band. He really leaned into uh, when he tours Europe, how they don't want him to mention widespread panic that he has anything to do with them. And okay. Sunday, we got Brian Thomas on John Brown's body and jamming versus improvising. Also, remember, um, we're going to have a show next Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. We'll have shorts. But then after that, we're taking seven days off to enjoy Dick's. Amanda and I have a lot of things uh, planned that we're going to be going through and trying to work out. We'll also be probably seeing Gorilla Toss on night zero. If anybody wants to check that out, but I'll be tweeting. She'll be on Instagram. She'll be on Facebook. So please find us out there. We'd love to say hi to everybody. Oh, so so let's, and we'll yeah. have stickers, Kevin. And we'll have stickers. Yes. <laughs> so let's jump into this first clip. And it's uh, Kevin talking about Larry Campbell, Mike Dillon and Robert Walters. They're all on the label and some interesting stuff. We'll see you on the other side. Uh, another thing that in my mind is a little similar you have coming out is uh, Larry Campbell or it's out yeah. already. At Le Bon Helm Studio, which I guess is near where you are, up yeah, there in upstate New York. Sort of like a home away from home. <laughs> you know, as far as like, it, you know, when I lived in Brooklyn, it was like Brooklyn Ball. And before that, it was Tonic and Knitting Factory. But now it's, um, now it's um, Le Bon Helm Studios, you know. So we, we, we go there to see music all the time. Um just this January, Marco did um, two nights there, two sold out shows there. That's now, you know, kind of like a reoccurring thing. Um, they they also do the, our partners in the festival that we that we do with Marco called Follow the Arrow. Um, and so, yeah, so Larry, you know, we just I got to know Larry's manager really well. Um, and, you know, they did that record. And I mean, it's it's kind of. A, you know, it's it's a like to work with Larry Campbell. Like I, I you know, the guy is just an incredible musician. He was Levon Helm's music director for uh, and guitarist for you know almost a decade. Like, you know, it's an honor. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> so, and Teresa yeah. is uh... and Teresa's you know his partner and it's it's so fantastic. I I love that they got on there. Yeah. Um, another new one you have coming out or that came out was Mike Dillon's album, which yep. 
is I'm really enjoying. You want to talk a little bit about that one? I know he put out what four albums in the past couple of years. Well, during during the pandemic, uh, Mike made three records: um, Suitcase Man, 1918, and Shoot the Moon. And uh, we just decided, like, you know, I Mike and I have a great relationship, and I I just fucking love Mike Dillon. Like he's he's literally like one of my favorite musicians ever favorite humans the guy is like so creative and and works hard and like soulful and um and you know and so you know he made three records during the pandemic and we were like why don't we just put them all out you know let's just press them up and put them out like your fan base i think will will dig it and buy them so we we put those out and those those records really mixed up all his like stuff. His like, because right before that we right before COVID we had put out a record called um, Rosewood, which was really like his jungle percussion thing. Um, but the, those three uh, we called it the the pandemic, the quarantine trilogy. Yeah, quarantine trilogy. We put those three records out. Um, they mixed up all his styles, and then it was actually over the pandemic when they when they were all living in New Orleans and New Orleans is one of the kind of first places to start coming back online with live music, not necessarily clubs, but people are just setting up on front steps mm -hmm. outside of tips and wherever they can can't go. Keep them play. down. You can't yeah, keep the New Orleans music people. in the streets, you know, and Mike, Brian Haas and Nikki Glassby started playing a lot together. And, um, you know, and then once touring kind of opened back up again, they got right back on the road and they went to the studio and made this, this record called Inflorescence. Um, Mike started calling the band Punkadelic and, um, which I love. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, you know, just, it's funny cause it's not, you know, it's, it's like, it's like punk in attitude, but not in right sonically. It's not like a punk rock record, you know, but maybe it's like, you know, it's all the attitude. It definitely is. It's I, the attitude, you know. And uh, you gotta love that. He he was he's very good at coming up with band names. I will give him that. Yeah, he's had some great ones. <laughs> Harry Apes, BMX, right? Uh, um, what Mike was Dylan's the, Go Go Jungle, right? The Dead Kenny G's, Dead Kenny that? G's, yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which I love. Um, yep. You mentioned Aquarian Drunkard. Let's talk a little bit about Robert Walter. What was going yeah. on with his release? Uh, Robert, the Lanya Obsession that we're putting out in March by Robert was actually his third one for Aquarian okay. Drunkard. They've, yeah, I think the 10th uh, is what I read, is what you said the drop was. Oh, the drop, yeah, March 10th, yep. Um, so Friday, so yeah, he, this Friday. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me put Ooh. that on my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm looking at my calendar like, whoa. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Robert Robert just did this fun, like fun little session for them before his, uh, what was it? It was this Spirit of 70 record. Uh, we, we Robert did a record called Spirit of 70 back in the 90s that we reissued during COVID. I hope I've got my timeline right here, but... Um, Anyway, um, yeah, we reissued that during COVID and uh, Aquarium Drunkard offered him to do the session. We did it. It lived on their website yeah, for, you know, a number of years. And now we'll, you know, we're just putting it out. So it's on all the streaming services. And, you know, right. it's, it wasn't like, you know, for Robert, it's not like a really a, an album project. It's just like a cool little thing he did he played all the instruments a bunch of cover tunes uh he know, does, does the melody he of, does uh grandmaster flash melly mel there yeah the exactly line. does a great version of white lines which was always the bar closing song when i was a bartender many years ago well <laughs> you Time know why when the bar's closing uh, <laughs> you can go do that somewhere else <laughs> exactly <laughs> 
Kevin, this was a really great chat. And I know that I wasn't available for this one, but, you know, in listening back and knowing all that Kevin has done over the years and continues to do for the scene, super fascinating. Um, we're going to get back into the interview here in a couple minutes, but first wanted to just share out with everybody that, as Kevin mentioned earlier, um, he does an incredible job of putting links and other show notes um, in with every upload that we have. So you can get a lot of good information there. We also have social media rocking. Um, that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, now threads, um, which Blue I'm going to start. Yep. And Blue Sky. I have to like make a list now to remember all of these. But everywhere. It's... We're, the, we're the same thing though. See, we were smart. We, yes. we made sure that we were the same at everywhere. <laughs> Honestly, in this day and age, I think that is a massive accomplishment. So I'm really happy about that. Um, so at all that jam pod, and it's probably the pod that lets us kind of make all of these the same. So easy yep. to remember. Um, and the website too, of the same name. Um, and so, yeah, make sure that wherever you get your information, you are checking us out. Um, I have really been enjoying, honestly, just seeing how um, a lot of the artists and people who are starting to get to know what we do um, are are responding and it's great. Um, but let's go ahead and get back into this. Um, Kevin, I know that you would talked with Kevin. <laughs> um, let me start over. Kevin, I know you all had talked about the state of the industry. So um, let's head back into that interview to hear what um, you all were chatting about. So where do you see, where do you see the future of our, of music being? Where do you see, you know, the recording industry as it becomes less, a, a lot of bands I talk to feel like they don't need a record label necessarily yeah. anymore no. that if they have an agent and a manager they can press it in independently and go forward. Where do you see the, the the place of record labels going into the future? I mean, I think record, I'm, I'm just like, I'm like an old school kind of dude, you know, like I, I, I don't, I don't, it's just a part of me that just doesn't give a fuck about the music business. Like I, I'm just doing what I do and like super grateful and, thankful that the artists I work with like want to work with me and I can be that guy to like, like could Mike Dillon press up his own records? Could Marco press up his own records? Could garage? Sure. But like, you know, these guys are all busy. They're, they're on the road a lot. Um, and, and, you know, I know a lot of these, these artists who do press up their records that come to me and ask me if I can do PR for them or do what I do for the Royal potato family artist because like like it or not like you you could press it up on your own just sell it off the stage but like you're not gonna like really grow your thing much or really like you know define it in a way outside of just selling it on your tour dates right w without a partner you know for the most part and so i think we we play a cool role that way and i i don't you know like I think there's a need for labels. Like I, I really like that this label is so super eclectic. Like you've got Mike Dillon and then you have Seth Walker. Then you have, you know, um, Larry Campbell and Teresa Williams. And then you have Garage Atois. And then, you, you know, and I, I, in my mind, like, I don't know if it always works this way, but I like to think because of the way I can like listen to music, um, which is just like, I, like, I love every genre of music, you know, I mean, there's a handful, like, I don't listen to a lot of metal, or, you know, I don't listen to a lot of, like, pop music, but, but I really, so I think in a way, like, maybe someone checks out a um, upstate record, and then that leads them back to a Seth Walker record, and maybe they'll listen to a Marco record, and then they'll discover a Leslie Mendelssohn record and it'll just, you know, that, that's in my mind that like, you know, and I think that's true. So it's like, we've really created this like, like little family here. And, and, you know, I, I, there's, there's a whole bunch of people that order everything we put out on vinyl, you know, that they, they just buy everything up and, so I know in that way, you know, I mean, we've, we've lasted, I've seen a shit ton of fucking record labels come and go in the last 15 years, just, and we've survived, we're still here, you know, so mm -hmm. something is working, even if it's not like, it hasn't become like, a, like a 
big label selling like massive volumes of 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 music it's it's just a place for artists to you know to have a home and a and a mm. way to get their records into the world in a very like perf- you know in a way that like can reach people beyond just uh and, know, just and when you become bigger, you become faceless almost, you know, there, there isn't that human personal touch that you get. It's like getting a loan through a bank or going to a, you know, a, a mortgage lender. Who's a guy yeah. that's, you know, up the street and he probably his kids on your basketball team kind yeah. of thing, you know? Oh, totally. I, I always say we're like, you know, we're your, we're your favorite farm to table record label you know? so if you if you could bring anybody onto the label who would you bring on who would you like to work with oh god that's a tough question we're, <laughs> we're we're about to i can't say it yet but we're about to announce someone i'm really excited to be working with um you know i don't like I don't know. I'm not, you know, who, who would I, I'd love to, I'd love to work with iron and wine. I'd love to work with, um, that's um, interesting. <laughs> iron and wine does. Uh, I mean, I guess I could see that, but I didn't expect that one. I'm not, you know, what's funny is like, I'm not like, aside from the grateful dead, I'm not like a real big jam band guy. And I, I don't really see a lot of the artists I work with being like, traditional jam bands and i think of more of it as a jazz label honestly yeah, like 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 the the borders of jazz and improv and um and then there's a lot of like singer songwriter stuff um you know i'd love to work with james mcmurtry i'd love to work with chris smither i'd love to you know there's but i'm not you know that's the other thing i'm not um the thing with this label has always been like we like the records that we put out of like i it's always just sort of like been drawn together by like some sort of cosmic force. It's not me going to um, like music venues and then like approaching the band after the show and being like, do you need a record deal? You know, or right. it's just like our circle of friends and our family. And it. Yeah. He interesting. Um, I guess my, my favorite thing about Kevin is that he really doesn't, give a fuck about most of what goes on and he does what he loves and he he really approaches it from a very pure point that he knows that maybe these artists don't need him but they want to work with him because he provides value to them which is something sorely missing i think in a lot of that part of the industry um you know fish is always tried you know, to help people. Trey has built that rehab center and all. You know, they've done other benefits in the past. They're hitting SPAC this weekend coming up and doing a benefit for the floods in Vermont. You know, that's their adopted home state. I don't think any of them are really from Vermont. And then they're doing Dicks the next week. So we, you know, decided to pull back up some thoughts on the summer. You know, how, are they holding up still? But what'd you get, Amanda? Yeah. So, Kevin, I love being able to just find out from people just like you and me, you know, fans who love fish, what they thought about uh, summer tour so far, you know, everything that's already happened. And so I've got a bunch of things to share. And what I love most about um, all of this is it's a combination of, you know, direct uh, response to the music itself. But then also for some people, when you ask them, what was the most meaningful, fun, you know, memorable part of tour for you so far? You're going to hear some things that actually don't have anything to do with the music, but it's more about community. So let me go through some of these. I'm going to start with um, Curtis, and I'm just going to use some first names here. Um, Curtis has been to almost every uh, show on Summer Tour. And um, one thing that he had mentioned uh, that I thought was really interesting, he said, um, theme from the bottom. And this was um, the July 30th show, the Sunday show at Madison Square Garden. Weird. It deserves its own thread. It's kind of like the 2023 equivalent of Island Tour Cavern. I mean, to make that kind of comparison going so far back, I thought was really interesting. So stuff like that always makes me pause and think. That was, I swear to God, it sounded so disjointed. On the after show, I was like, what the fuck just happened with that? And as for the cavern, the Island Tour Cavern, 
they yeah. did the island tour cavern to open one night at msg they did the funky intro to it isn't that so interesting yeah so putting pieces together um for people that have been seeing the band for a really long time i love that one person's kind of take on a song is going to bring them somewhere where i would maybe never have thought that but then it makes me you know listen again and maybe hear something that i didn't so I thought that was really interesting. That one kind of made me uh, think for a little bit. Now, um, this is in, this is kind of another fun one too. Um, so this person here, um, she goes by Kierce. She shared a hotel elevator with um, Tom on the final night of MSG. And he said to the group um, as he got off, now this is Tom Marshall, of course, right. see you guys in December. Um, and so she's still reeling, you know, could there even be a better source for New Year's information. So that was the kind of ushers. Fun. <laughs> right. The the, uh, I've heard from multiple people that the <laughs> ushers said to him, see in December. So yeah. There you go. I mean, you gotta love it. So I just love when those moments happen. Um, that is definitely her highlight, and I can definitely see why that would be the case. Um, Julie, this one is really personal, but I, I really wanted to share this. Um, Julie just beat stage four colon cancer. Um, and she credits a lot of that with the help of a um, nature path who tracked a lot of data and she really feels like this person saved her life. So they decided to break through that, you know, doctor patient relationship um, and go to see uh, the Saturday night Alpharetta show together as kind of a meaningful way to celebrate. And that just got me. I thought that was a really beautiful thing. That's a tearjerker. For sure. Right. And so when people can share those those memories and moments, and they want to do it at a fish show says so much. All right, here, this one, Kevin, I'm very curious to get your thoughts on, and I did. I know I didn't share these with you ahead of time. Um, Mike said, I've read a bit about John being on fire this year, so Fishman, um, and he said what he didn't understand until really beginning to watch um, a lot of the shows on tour is that Fishman's been facing forward almost all the time, Mike looks to him, even Trey. Um, and basically this was something he said, it took him until the end of this part of the tour to really catch on to. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if that's something that you've noticed or maybe that's come up on, you know, what plus after shows, just Fishman's positioning and maybe him either leading or, or being kind of a driving force in a different way than he may have been before. Well, we got into a whole conversation about Guy Forget about um the way fish um live fish originally tracked it it was 17 minutes so when they went from tweezer started playing it tim when we were on the after show said no it was eight minutes long because fishman started playing tweezer again but none of the rest of the band latched on and we got into this whole drummers getting no respect thing but i really do think that uh a lot of the time yes that um trey and mike I can't say Paige as much because mm -hmm. he's further away. I feel like Paige focuses on Trey. He yeah. looks to him for his cues. But I think that, yes, Fishman and Trey are, I don't know. I mean, they just, I, I think out of all the relationships in that band, those two are one person, ultimately, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then um, I'll just share maybe one or two others. In terms of um, moments, you know, specific moments at shows from um, this uh, this most recent part of the tour, um, Amanda, not me, another wonderful Amanda said, um, Army of One in Philly was pretty amazing for her. Um, she found that it's a sign from her little girl who had passed away. She never really thought about the lyrics until after losing her daughter. And there were some days where that song really pulled her out of some dark places. Um, and so uh they saw their first uh show she and her husband with on um, their other children in california uh the band played it um so that was another moment for them and then she got it in philly and it was just a, a reminder so um we all have those moments where songs really hit on a personal level that was hers um so we're I really not trying to make you all cry you're not i know of course i i go toward these right but i'll uh i'll just mention one more and you know i i heard a lot of people talking about mics from the august 4th msg show a lot of people talking big you know best version that they have played in decades um you know that that hands down was a top musical moment that can jam uh, right 
put it into a time machine. And so um, that one came up quite a bit when I was chatting with people. I think my favorite moment was, and I wasn't even there, was uh, Bobby and Danielle Weiberg and East Coast Emo over on Twitter. He proposed to her at the one of the msg shows and he put some videos out of it and another tearjerker but you know i i guess not resulting out of tragedy you yes, know it's, yes. it's love just... is not dead kevin even in my <laughs> my cold jaded heart we love it we want to see that and i love when that happens i think that's always the best it is it is all right <laughs> so with that remember find us at dicks where we'll put out where we are we're probably i know i'm going to be hanging in the wedge you were hanging in the wedge last year. I was, and I plan to be again. There you go. So that's what, uh, so make sure that you look for us there. And with that, I'm going to say stay beautiful, but don't stay underground too long. I'll see you soon, Amanda. Have a good one.